All right, before we begin, let's just get it out of the way. I don't know, over two centuries of development and the biggest impact monorails have had on English-speaking society is that one episode of The Simpsons. But that's not for want of trying. There have been many attempts to make monorails a thing, and yet very few serious attempts to use them as public transport have succeeded. There are various reasons for this, and they might make a fun video in themselves. Let me know in the comments section if that would be a thing of interest. But today I'm going to talk about one of the more ambitious schemes proposed in London, which dates from the early years of the 20th century. The North Metropolitan and Regent's Canal Railway, proposed in 1903. As the name implies, this would have made its way around North London, mostly following the course of the Regent's Canal. It would have run from Royal Oak in the west to Victoria Dock in the east, with branches to serve Broad Street, Wilsdon Junction and Commercial Road. There had been proposals to build railways along the Regent's Canal. Actually, in 1882, the canal had been bought out by the Regent's Canal City and Docks Railway Company, which did nothing with it. These schemes generally involved filling the canal in and replacing it with railway track. The NMRCR, as I'm going to call it from now on, would have been an elevated railway above the canal. I suspect it was at least partly inspired by the then-new monorail in Wuppertal, which is elevated above a river. It would have carried passengers while leaving freight to the barges. Since passenger transport on the canals was a fairly rare thing in those days, the line posed no threat to the canal itself, at least in terms of competition. The engineer behind it was Fritz Baer, who had made his name building conventional railways, but was fascinated by the possibilities of monorails. He was particularly intrigued by the work of French engineer Charles Lartigue. Lartigue's system was inspired, it is said, by the way camels in Algeria balanced loads on their back. His design consisted of a single rail on an A-frame trestle, with two stabilising rails halfway down. Which means that, technically, I suppose it's not really a monorail. The rolling stock would be divided in two, with each half hanging either side of the rail giving it a centre of gravity below the wheels. The first successful use of this design was on a mule-hauled railway in the Algerian desert. Lartigue's thinking was that the shifting sands would bury a conventional railway all too easily. But the best-known Lartigue railway has to be the Listowel and Ballybunion Railway in County Kerry, Ireland. This was steam-hauled and, on the whole, was fairly successful. It worked, the trains didn't fall off the track. Well, there was one incident, but that was sabotage. The trouble was that although it worked, it raised the obvious question of... why? It was a railway that didn't really do anything that a conventional railway couldn't, the only real advantage being the lower cost of construction. Its points had to be manually pushed into place. Trains had to be fitted with footbridges, because the track was an obstacle. And then, like reading the news today, there was the question of balance. Despite the stabilising rails, loads had to be equally distributed on either side of the trains. Therefore, to balance loads out, the trains would often have to carry excess and unnecessary weight, like me after Christmas. The engines had two boilers and needed both members of crew to stoke the fires. It was a lot of hassle, all in all. Fritz Baer was the engineer behind the line, and despite everything, he thought there was potential there. But the line he envisaged for London would be rather different. In many ways, it would be more akin to the kinds of monorails we see today. Firstly, it would be electrically powered. Secondly, it would be elevated above the canal. And, as with many modern urban railways, it was to consist of many stations placed fairly closely together, trains running at a maximum speed of about 20 miles per hour. In engineering terms, it would have been fairly simple. The canal had already done most of the hard work, and the supports wouldn't take up much space. Tunnels would be needed. The canal tunnels definitely couldn't take the railway. There were some very tight curves, but monorails are able to take tight curves in a way that conventional railways cannot. Points were to be used as little as possible. Bear had certainly thought his design through, and he was one of the few engineers who really had experience with Lartigue monorails. 
I don't know if it would have worked, but if anyone could make it work, Bear was the man. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. It went no further than a proposal. I fear, though, that had it gone further, it would have run into trouble with a rival company. The North London Railway was a company that ran from Willesden Junction to Broad Street and the docks, i.e. much the same route as this railway. They were also a company whose greatest money spinner was commuters, i.e. the same market that the NMRCR was going after. They were a small company, but they generally came down pretty hard on anything they perceived as competition. They would almost certainly have opposed any parliamentary bill to build this monorail. They might not have succeeded, but the North London Railway had the advantage of being well established and, crucially, being a conventional railway. In other words, they could run trains over other people's tracks, and vice versa. The NMRCR didn't have that flexibility. The North London could also bring in additional revenue through freight, i.e. the market that the NMRCR specifically wasn't touching. But as the 20th century went on, the arrival of trams, buses and the underground would bring another form of competition to the North London Railway, one they couldn't fight so easily. They would see a decline in passenger numbers as those people chose more direct or cheaper routes. And it's hard to see the NMRCR not running into the same issue. Then there's the NIMBYs. The western end of the Regent's Canal runs through some very classy parts of London, and when it was being built there was plenty of opposition from the wealthy residents. It's hard to see those people being fine with an elevated railway passing just a few yards from their houses. So the North Metropolitan and Regent's Canal Railway was only a proposal. If it had been formally put forward, it would have been opposed. If it had succeeded, it would likely have gone bankrupt. All in all, this isn't so much a might-have-been as a probably-for-the-best-it-wasn't. Hello all, I do hope you enjoyed today's video. If and you did, it may please you to click the like button or even subscribe to get more content like this. I'd like to thank my donors on Kofi and Patreon. As ever, you are the stabilizing rails to my Lartig monorail. And I'll see you all again very soon. Cheerio.